Now a brief introduction of Venerable Tupdum Children, the founder and the abbeys of Sarasti Abbey. Establishing Sarasti Abbey fulfills a long-held vision for Venerable Children to share the Buddha's teachings with the Western Sangha, training in the monastic code, doing prayers and practices in the monastic in English and incorporating the best element of Western society, including gender, gender equality, social engagement, and using technology to spread the Dharma. A native to the US, Venerable Children has trained in Asia for many years. In close to 40 years of her ordained life, Venerable Children has lived in several monastic communities in Asia and in the West. She brings her wisdom from, ex from these experiences to shape the growing monastic community at Sarasti Abbey. In addition to being abbeys of Sarasti Abbey, Venerable Children is an author of many books and teaches around the world. She has also co-authored a book with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions. Her teachings are also available on the web in, the, in audio and video format. Without further ado, brothers and sisters, please rise and put our palms together to welcome Venerable Children. Brothers and sisters, please put your palms together and make three half bows to the Venerable. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. Okay, so we're very cozy tonight. And some people will have the fan blowing on them and not like it, and some people will be too far away from the fan and not like that. So we'll all just be unhappy together. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and in that way, we may be more comfortable than without the fan. Okay. So, I want to welcome you all here this evening and also thank the folks at Pureland Marketing, my old friends who are so kind and hospitable and take such good care of us for offering this space and enabling us to meet here so that we can share the Dharma together. So, uh, we're going to be <coughs> talking about Shanti Deva's text uh, here the title is translated, A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. It's also translated as Engaging in the Bodhisattva's Deeds. And so I started teaching this text, how many years ago was it? Anybody remember? Many years ago. Because the idea was that, you know, I come every year and so I would 
teach a little bit of the text every year until we finished it. So the text has 10 chapters. We've completed six of them already and we're just at the beginning of the seventh chapter now. However, I'm sure you'll be able to understand what's written in this chapter even if you haven't heard the first six chapters. However, the first six ones are on the web and I think there's a DVD, right, with them downstairs so that you can watch and catch up if you wish. But since we're starting at the beginning of a new chapter, uh, I think you'll all be okay. So I always uh, like to start things with a little bit of meditation and some prayers. So I think, do we have uh, the prayers that we can put on the screen or not? Hold on. <laughs> so the reason we recite different verses um, before we do teachings or meditation is so that we can f focus on the meaning of the verses and by doing that uh, it transforms our mind. Yeah, because the verses were written by great uh, masters in the past, according to their understanding, if we recite those words, it helps us to gain the same understanding that they do. So it's not just a question of reciting the words and th the mere recitation itself uh, is virtuous. It's the mental transformation that occurs in our mind through focusing on the meaning. So, uh, if you look, okay, um, can, can everybody see, kind of, maybe a little bit? Um, then we'll, we'll do these recitations, so you'll change the verse each time. Uh, the first verse we do three times, and then we'll go on to the other verses. Yeah, so just go back to the first one, and then, yeah. Okay, so when we do the, the uh, recitations, in the space in front, you imagine the Buddha with his body made of golden light, and he's surrounded by all the other Buddhas and all the Bodhisattvas. So really feel like you're in the presence of so many amazing holy beings. And then, so they're in front of you and all around you are all the sentient beings, human beings, animals, and so forth. And as we recite the verses, we think that we're leading all the other sentient beings in taking refuge and generating all the thoughts and feelings described in the verses. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create, by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge <coughs> until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create, by engaging, <laughs> may I attain Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create, by engaging in generosity and the... Uh, 
reaching practices. May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I'm sorry, there's two ways of chanting it, and I did the wrong one. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I can toss all my destructive actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtue of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of Dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate all the virtues of myself and others for a great awakening. And then we'll recite the Buddha's mantra seven times. And while we do so, imagine that beautiful rainbow-colored light is flowing from the Buddha, who's seated in front of you, into you and into all the sentient beings around you and that this light purifies all negativities and brings all realizations of the path. (coughs) Taya ta muni muni maha muni asoha Taya ta muni muni Maha Muniya Soha Taya Ta Mune Mune Maha Muniya Soha Taya Ta Mune Mune Maha Muniya Soha Taya Ta Mune meditation. Okay, so while they're doing that, look at me, don't look (laughs) at them. (laughs) Okay, some of you are still looking at them, Mm -hmm. because I want to uh, just give you um, a little bit of background on this text, okay? It was one of the uh, the texts I studied, maybe I, I had known the Dharma maybe a year and a half, something like that. And then Geshe Zopa was at Kopan Monastery where I was at. And he began teaching this text. And the combination of an amazing text with an amazing teacher was really very powerful. And uh, I have come over the years to appreciate Shanti Deva's very direct method of teaching. He doesn't pull any punch- punches. He's not polite. Yeah, he tells it like it is. Yeah. So if we have wrong views and we're not looking at something in a correct way, he just tells us straight out what the problem is. And I like that approach very much because my mind can make up all sorts of excuses for not practicing or not practicing properly. And Shanti Deva cuts through every single one of them. So I need that kind of direct method 
in order to learn. Yeah. If uh, Shanti Deva was really nice and said, Oh, dear children, you're such an excellent practitioner. You'll be enlightened soon. May I suggest you do one little thing? I wouldn't listen. Yeah, it's only because he goes, Look at what you're doing, kid. This does not work. <laughs> that then I wake up and listen. Okay. So Shanti Deva. When, when you hear his life story, you wouldn't think that he would be that kind of teacher because he, uh, he lived in the 8th century and as the story goes, he uh, was in a monastery and he, wa- he was known as the monk who does three things. What are the three things? Eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. Okay, that was his reputation. That's all he did. He, it looked like on the surface that all day long he was just the laziest monk sitting in his room, not doing anything. Actually, he was an incredible erudite scholar and meditator, but he didn't show that on the outside. So the monks thought he was just some lazy thing eating their food and they wanted to get rid of him. But they couldn't just tell him to leave. They had to embarrass him and make him leave by himself. So they had this plan and they invited him to teach, yeah, to give a teaching and asked all the people in the surrounding area to come. But they built a throne that was very, very high, knowing that when he came up to the throne, he wouldn't be able to get on it because it was so high, because they didn't put any stairs. So Shantideva comes up to the throne to teach. He looks up. It's a really high throne. He puts his hand on the top, he lowers the top of the throne, sits on it, and then elevates it back up again. Meanwhile, they're all going, who is this guy who just did that? Anyway, they figured they listened to to his teaching because he was so lazy he wouldn't be able to teach. Well, what he taught was this book. Yeah. When he got to the ninth chapter, which is about emptiness, the nature of reality, as the story goes, he elevated from the throne and went up in the sky and disappeared. And all they could hear was his voice teaching the chapter. So he did leave the monastery, but the monks realized that they lost a great teacher because of it. Okay. (coughs) It seems that he only wrote one other book, uh, which is the Compendium of Sutra, uh, where he took uh, passages from various sutras and compiled that. And there's rumor of maybe a third book, but nobody knows really where it is or what it is. I'm not sure. So in this book, there's 10 chapters. Yeah, it starts out with the benefits of bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is that aspiration for full awakening, for the benefit of all beings. So it starts out talking about the benefits of that. Then it goes on to the dis- a chapter called The Disclosure of Misdeeds. So before we can really become an altruistic being, you know, we have to do some purification because we've all created negative deeds before. So that this chapter is one where you're confessing those negative deeds and purifying them. Then the f- third chapter is where we completely generate bodhicitta and take the bodhisattva vow, in other words, to practice the path to full awakening. 
The fourth chapter is on conscientiousness. So having taken the bodhisattva precepts, we now need to be conscientious to keep them well. So we need to have a respect for ethical conduct, uh, an appreciation for living an ethical life. That leads us to the fifth chapter, which is called Guarding Alertness, where we really start checking up on our own behavior to see if we're living according to our precepts and our values and principles, or if we're somewhere in la-la land, Uh, rationalizing all of our bad actions. That leads us to the sixth chapter, which is on fortitude or patience. And that chapter, it's one of my favorites. The book, uh, Working with Anger, is based on that chapter. And that uh, chapter deals with uh, three kinds of fortitude. The first one is the fortitude of uh, enduring criticism and uh, harm that other people give us. Okay. In other words, how to work with our anger and our temper. The second kind of fortitude is um, enduring suffering, having a strong mind that can endure suffering. And the third kind is the fortitude of practicing the Dharma, which can entail a lot of um, inner strength to do. So that was the chapter that we completed last year when I was here in this room. Okay, then this year we're about to start on chapter seven, which is about joyous effort or or enthusiasm. Chapter eight, which we won't get to today, but I want to tell you about, is on meditation. And in it, he talks about how to uh, generate renunciation so we can go off and really develop shamatha or serenity. And he also gives this amazing teaching on how to cultivate bodhicitta by equalizing and exchanging self with others. So we'll get to this chapter in the future. The ninth chapter is on wisdom, the nature of reality. And the tenth chapter is a dedication of merit. Do we have the um, Star Spangled Compassion so that we can put it on the screen? Do you know? Uh-huh. With for tomorrow, okay. Because uh, the chapter 10, we've extracted some verses from it and set it to uh, the melody of the uh, US national anthem, which is a very violent song. You know, so many national anthems are violent. Is the Singaporean national anthem violent? No? Good for you. (laughs) Yeah? The French national anthem, very violent. So is the U.S. national anthem. So we decided we were going to purify our national anthem. (laughs) And we took Shantideva's verses and made it, you know, to that. Do you have it on your computer? Because maybe... You could project it on the screen at the end. Okay. Shall yeah. Okay. So she's going to email it to her. So he'll get it, and he'll then put it up here. <laughs> okay. That's cooperation. <laughs> okay. So. We'll go back, uh, chapter seven, on enthusiasm or joyous effort. Yeah, so I'll read each verse and then comment a little bit on it, okay? Do we have chapter seven up there? Okay, so they call it enthusiasm. I prefer the translation of joyous effort, but it comes to the same point, you know. You have to be eager and enthusiastic and wanting to do something. 
do you, do you want to put the verses up? Okay. So I'm going to use sometimes slightly different vocabulary, uh, you know, according to the, the translation terms that I, li- I prefer. Okay, so verse 1 says, Having fortitude, I should develop joyous effort. For awakening will dwell only in those who exert themselves. Just as there is no movement without wind, so merit does not occur without joyous effort. Okay, so having developed inner strength through practicing patience or fortitude, now we want to develop joyous effort. Okay, why? Because we'll only be able to attain our spiritual goal of full awakening if we put forth energy. Okay? And our energy has to be joyful energy. It can't be the kind of energy of I should and I ought to and I'm supposed to but I really don't want to. (laughs) Okay? Because you can't imagine somebody being a Buddha or a Bodhisattva and having that kind of attitude, can you? You know, kind of the Buddha going, oh, I guess I should benefit some sentient beings. I really don't feel like it today. I want to stay home and watch TV. (laughs) You know, the Buddha doesn't have that kind of attitude. So we have to overcome our own sluggishness. Mm -hmm. And then he says, just as there's no movement without wind, you know, things are not going to move without the wind, so we cannot accumulate wisdom or good karma, which is like fertilizing, fertilizer for our mind so the seeds of the good, uh, the seeds of the teachings can grow into realizations. So we can't accumulate merit and our merit cannot produce the result of full awakening unless we have joyous effort. Okay? Because without joyous effort we aren't going to do anything, are we? Yeah, we're just going to be couch potatoes like so many of us are. You know, come home from work, sit down. (laughs) Pull up your TV clicker. You know, or if you or if you don't use the TV, you're on the computer, uh, looking for distraction, amusement, something to take the boredom out of your life. Yeah, that kind of attitude is not going to get us anywhere. Yeah, we have to have a really like eager attitude that that loves uh, creating merit, that loves creating virtue. Yeah. So Shantideva is going to teach us how to do that. So, ch- so verse 2, what is joyous effort? So here is, he's giving us a definition. It is finding joy in what is wholesome. Okay? That's all joyous effort is. It's finding joy, being enthusiastic, taking delight in virtue in what is wholesome. Yeah? That's all it is. Yeah? But imagine what you would feel like if you took delight in virtue as opposed in taking delight in non-virtue. Yeah? Be a big shift in your mind, wouldn't it? And wouldn't you be a lot happier? There would be no more shoulds and ought tos and supposed tos in your life, especially regarding Dharma practice. There would just be a mind that says, oh, wow, I want to do this. Yeah, kind of like a kid in a candy store. Better than a kid in a candy store because you're not going to get cavities. (laughs) Okay. So, the second line of verse 2 says, its opposing factors are explained as laziness, attraction to what is harmful, 
and despising oneself out of despondency. So what interferes with us having delight in virtue? We're lazy. Okay, so there's actually three kinds of laziness. The first kind of laziness is just liking to lie around. You know that one. Yeah, we do it every weekend. (laughs) Yeah, you just lie around. Yeah, sleep late, wake up, have your coffee, go back to sleep. Yeah, watch a movie, take a nap. (laughs) Yeah, like that, okay? The second kind of laziness is attraction to what is harmful. Yeah, so what that means is being really busy. Yeah, you're all going to look, uh-oh, you know, because... You know, what is harmful? All of our attachment to, you know, sense pleasure, all of our self-centered mind that's always, I want, I like, what can I have, what can I get? I want to be famous, I want a good reputation, I want all the praise in the whole family, I don't want blame. Yeah, and so I'm going to try and arrange the whole world so I can have everything I want and be free of all the people that I don't like. Okay, so that's attraction, the laziness of attraction to what is harmful. Why is it called laziness? Not because we're lying around, because when we're attracted to harmful things, we're really busy but we're lazy in terms of practicing virtue. Okay, We're busy running around, closing lots of business deals, you know, trying to get a promotion, trying to get more, uh, increase our paycheck, yeah, going on vacation here and there, buying good food, buying, you know, aftershave lotion and perfume, buy, getting this, getting that. You know, all the things that we usually do to keep ourselves really busy that are not involved in creating virtue. Okay. Then the third kind of laziness is despising ourselves out of despondency. So this is a mind in which we put ourselves down. You know, this whole Dharma thing is just too hard. Enlightenment's too high. Yeah, the path is too difficult. And I'm inadequate anyway. I really can't do it, you know? You expect me to be like Kuan Yin? Forget it. Yeah, I just want to sit here and criticize myself and feel sorry for myself. Because really I'm hopeless. I'm so stupid. I can't get anything right. I don't know what's wrong with me. The dark is just too hard. Okay, you know that mind? Okay, so that's a form of laziness. Again, because when we're involved in self-pity and low self-esteem, we're lazy in terms of practicing the Buddha's teachings. Okay. Then verse 3. So with verse 3, we're going to start on the... F- um, wait a minute, no, verse 3. Okay. So the verse 3 is starting us on the f- to explore the first kind of laziness. So that's the laziness of lying around all day and putting off Dharma practice. You know how we put off Dharma practice? Do you do that? 
Yeah, you go to a Dharma teaching in the evening, you come home with great resolve. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and meditate. You set your alarm, you go to sleep, the alarm goes off, you smash it down, and you go back to sleep. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> yeah, so this verse is starting you know, on helping us to get over that habit. So verse 3 says, because of attachment to the pleasurable taste of idleness, because of craving for sleep, and because of having no disillusionment with the misery of cyclic existence, laziness grows very strong. Okay, so we have attachment to the pleasurable taste of idleness. Yeah, like when you go on a ho on holiday, yeah, you can wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning, then you go down and eat breakfast, yeah, read the newspaper, lie on the beach, eat lunch, lie on the beach some more, <laughs> read another book, eat dinner, go out drinking, gambling a little bit, but you're too drunk to realize that you've just lost a lot of money, and go to sleep. Okay, so attachment to the pleasurable taste of idleness. I'm going to practice tomorrow. Yeah, I'm busy today. I'm tired today. I work so hard. I just got the promotion, so now instead of working eight hours, I get to work 12 hours. So I'm so tired after work. I'll practice tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes. I'm still tired. I'll practice on the weekend. The weekend comes. I'm tired, I'll go to a retreat, and then I'll practice. The time of the retreat comes, and it goes, and you say, I'll go next year to the retreat. Okay. Somehow we never get ourselves there. Okay. Any of you like that? There's a few honest people. How many of you have promised to come to the Abbey but never come? <laughs> oh, I'm looking at a few of you. Mm -hmm. Hello, two of you over there. Yeah, you've come, but you need to stay longer. <laughs> yeah, and the other two in the back of the room are hiding. <laughs> yeah, and a few of you in the middle, too. Okay, so practicing later. Then, so that's part of it. Then the second part of it, uh, of this, uh, you know, laziness of, of idleness, is craving for sleep. Yeah. So sleep is great. The problem is we're not awake to enjoy it. So you sleep and you sleep and you sleep and you get up and it, doesn't really matter how much you've slept, does it? Because it's all under the bridge and you don't even remember it. Okay, craving for sleep. <laughs> yeah, I think I've taught long enough. I want to go to bed. <laughs> and because of having no disillusion meant disillusionment, it should say, with the misery of psych cyclic existence. So we don't really understand what cyclic existence is. It doesn't disillusion us. We hear that we get born old, sick, and die again and again, and we say, oh, well, yeah, so. We don't really get it, how miserable that is getting born, getting old, getting sick, and dying. And then again, getting born, getting old, getting sick, and dying. And again, doing it. And in the middle, not getting what we want, 
having problems because we get what we don't want and sometimes even getting what we want and not being satisfied with it and it not fulfilling us. Yeah. And, but we don't realize the state we're in. We just look around and say, well, I live in the middle of Singapore and it's a busy city and everybody's doing this and nobody's thinking about what is the meaning of my life and nobody's thinking about how did I get here. Yeah, they're all thinking about their friends and their family and how to have a good time and how to make more money. Yeah? So we don't think about any of these really important issues in life. And as a result, we have no disillusionment with the state that we're in. So they often compare it to a person who's in prison, which is pretty miserable, but they don't care they're in prison. They say, it's okay. I have a bed to sleep in. I have free food three times a day. Good enough. I don't need to be free. I'll just stay in prison. Yeah? Such a person's pretty stupid, isn't it? Aren't they? Yeah? So, but we're actually like that. Yeah, you look around, all these people running around and none of them are really looking at, you know, I'm in the middle of getting born, aging, getting sick and dying again and again under the influence of ignorance and polluted karma. And I have no say in the matter. I'm just being pushed my, by my mental defilements pushed by my karma, by my previous actions. They don't realize this. And so, Dharma practice, not so interesting. I'll do it tomorrow, or the next day, or the next year, or the next lifetime. Yeah, this lifetime I want to have a good time. Next lifetime I'll practice the Dharma. Problem is, next lifetime, we may not have the opportunity to practice the Dharma because we may be born as an animal or a hungry ghost or a hell being or who knows what. Yeah. Then you say, oh, being born as an animal isn't so bad. You have cats at the Abbey. I see them when you stream teachings. <laughs> They're cute little kitties. Yeah, they curl up and sleep during the whole teaching. Yeah, at least when they're not chasing each other. Yeah, so that's not so bad. I want to be born as a cat at a, at a monastery. Then I get to s sleep through all the teachings and nobody's <laughs> going to wake me up. Okay, and we think, oh, ignorance is bliss. Yeah, ignorance is not bliss. Uh, do you really want to be a cat at a monastery? Okay, you get to listen to a lot of teachings, but you don't understand a single one. Even the most basic teaching like, don't chase mice and don't kill bugs because they want to be alive as much as you do. Yeah, we try and teach our cats that. They look at us. <laughs> yeah, what are you saying? <laughs> Human being, what are you saying? Yeah. So even the you know, even the first precept not to harm other living beings, not to kill them. We tell that to our cats. Yeah, they don't listen. They can't understand. There's a living being in that cat body, but they can't understand. So we really don't want to be born in that kind of situation. That's not so good. Okay? Let alone be born as a cockroach. Yeah. Then you have everybody in Singapore running after you. <laughs> you know, with their shoe, waiting to go whack. 
or calling the exterminator who comes and goes with all this poison. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be a cockroach? That's no fun either, really. I had a friend who lives in San Francisco. She had so many cockroaches. Her cockroaches aren't like the cockroaches here. Cockroaches here are big cockroaches. You guys grow really big cockroaches. <laughs> At least the ones I've seen here. And in Hong Kong, oh, Hong Kong has really big ones. In America, we have small cockroaches. <laughs> you know, it's the only thing that's small in America. <laughs> Yeah, we have big egos, but small cockroaches. <laughs> so my friend had lots of cockroaches in her flat. So, and, she, you know, she was a Buddhist. She wasn't going to kill them. So she used to call them her disciples. <laughs> and pray in a, that in a future life, they'd be born human and she could teach them the Dharma. Yeah. So her disciples would be running all over the flat. Yeah? So uh, anyway, you know, we don't really want to keep putting off the Dharma until next life because if we think it's hard practicing as a cat, it's going to be even harder practicing as a cockroach. Okay. So with these three... Atta being attached to the pleasant state of idleness, craving for sleep, and no disillusionment with the misery of cyclic existence, laziness grows very strong. Verse 4. Enmeshed in the snare of disturbing conceptions, I have entered the snare of birth. Why am I still not aware that I live in the mouth of the Lord of Death? Okay, so we're completely caught up in wrong conception mind at which makes us crave to take birth in cyclic existence in samsara. And even when we take birth, we're still not aware that as soon as we are conceived in our mother's womb, we are in the process of dying. So as soon as we're conceived, we are already in the mouth of the Lord of Death. So there's no real Lord of Death, okay? This is just anthropomorphizing it. You know, don't think that there's a boogeyman hiding under your chair who's going to get you. It's not like that, okay? But the point is, yeah, that... We're all, no matter what age we are, in the process of aging, and aging ends in death. In fact, birth ends in death. So you know when you're in the ho when someone's in the hospital and they die on the fo on the death certificate, you know they always write in. You know, for my mother they wrote pneumonia. For my father they wrote choking on food. They always have to put a cause of death. What's the real cause of death? Birth. But when babies are born, we go, wow, fantastic. This is so great. There's a baby. Yeah? But in actual fact, and in one way, considering if the baby has a precious human life so they can practice the Dharma, that's very good. But another way of looking at it, yeah, as soon as we're born, we're in, in the process of dying, going towards death. And there's no way to avoid it. We're all going to die. Yeah. So there's no sense getting depressed over it. Yeah, we've done it millions of times. Yeah, in samsara, because we've been born again and again, beginningless times, because there's beginning us lifetimes. So death is nothing new for us. But we still can't say it's our favorite activity, can we? It's not. Yeah. And so we don't pay attention to the fact that death is definite, 
for all of us, and that there's absolutely no way to avoid it. You can go any place you want to in this universe. There's no place to go where we're not going to die. Why? Because we took birth under the influence of karma. Karma was the uh, principal cause for our rebirth. Yeah. When that karma runs out, then the life runs out. Since karma is a created thing, anything that's created runs out. It ceases. Okay, so there's no way to avoid death. Verse 5, do I not see that he, the Lord of death, is systematically slaughtering my species? Whoever remains soundly asleep surely behaves like a buffalo with a butcher. So here we are, born, we're in the mouth of the Lord in, of death and the fact that we're in the process of approaching death. <laughs> okay. And we don't realize that all these people are dying around us. Or if we realize that people die around us, we have the thought, oh, that's too bad, but it's not going to happen to me. Don't we? Yeah. Death happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. Yeah. Of course, all the people who died today also thought death happened to other people. But they died today. Okay. So we have some pretty strong ignorance that doesn't let us acknowledge the reality of our own mortality. Yeah. We really think, okay, maybe I'll age, but I'm not really going to die. Yeah. The oldest person who's alive now is 117. I'm going to break that record. <laughs> yeah. I'll live to be at least 217 or 317 or a hundred million and seventeen. But death is not going to happen to me. Wrong. So poorly, so surely we behave like a buff buffalo with a butcher. Yeah. Have you ever seen animals who are being shipped off to the butcher? If you go to India sometime, you'll see it. In the States, I've seen it too, on the highways. You know, cows inside big trucks, chickens in cages. Yeah. And they're being shipped off with no choice, no control over their own lives to the butcher. Yeah. So if we don't have any cognizance of our own mortality, we're kind of like that. You know, we're just in the truck going towards death without even realizing it until death is near and then we freak out. Just like the animals when they, you know, arrive at the the place where they're going to be slaughtered and they sense what's going on there, they completely freak out. Yeah. Okay. So the topic of death is not something morose. Yeah, we shouldn't see it as negative and morose. It's simply reality. Yeah, there's nothing morose about it. It's just nature. It's just reality. Yeah. And I don't know about your family, but in my family, we didn't talk about death. 
because there was the feeling that if you talked about it, it might happen. <laughs> yeah. So if you didn't talk about it, it wouldn't happen. Hmm? So instead of saying that somebody died, we say they passed away, they're gone, they're no longer here. We have all sorts of other ways besides saying they're dead. Yeah, we have to be polite after all. But it's really rather strange, isn't it? Because it's a universal experience. Yeah, even all the great leaders in the world, great religious leaders, they've all died. Yeah? Nobody lives forever, except me. <laughs> yeah, that's what we think. Except me. I'm going to be the special one. Verse 6. When having blocked off every escape route, the Lord of Death is looking for someone to kill. How can I enjoy eating? And likewise, how can I enjoy sleep? Okay? So again, anthropomorphizing death, making it like a Lord of Death who is looking for us, yeah. So given that we're aging, approaching death, how can we just kind of lie back and eat our noodles like nothing is happening? Yeah, how can we just lie back, ah, sleep a lot, you know, without being aware that our lifespan is diminishing moment by moment and that we have this precious human life with the opportunity to practice the Dharma, but it's getting shorter as each moment passes. And if we don't use our life to accumulate merit, to generate wisdom and bodhicitta, then all of our lifetime is going to pass by and at the time of death we're going to have nothing to show for it. At least nothing in terms of the Dharma. We may have a ton of material possessions and a huge bank account, but none of that comes with us to the next life. Yeah, none of it. Even it they burn a million dollars in fake money for you. You're not going to get it in your next life. Mm -hmm. No matter how many computers they burn, no matter how many people cry, yeah, on your, you know, around your, your cremation place and beat their chest. Uh. I heard some some clans hire people to wail, you know, at a funeral. Yeah, because the more people wail, then the more loved you are. <laughs> so you hire some people to wail to show that the deceased one is loved. Hmm. <laughs> I don't understand that one. <laughs> okay. So Shandi Dev is saying, you know, how can we just enjoy sleeping and eating if that's our condition? Now that does not mean that we should not eat and sleep. Okay, he's not telling you to stay up all night. He's not telling you to go on a diet. Okay? He's saying, you know, if you sleep, if you eat, do it with bodhicitta. Don't do it out of laziness. But don't sleep and eat more than you need to. Instead, use your time for something constructive. Okay. Verse 7. For as long as death is actually approaching, then I shall accumulate merit. Even if I then put a stop to laziness, what will be the use? This, that is not the time. So the first two lines, for as long as death is actually approaching, then I shall accumulate merit. So that's good. Starting now, this moment, yeah, to make sure we have a good intention, because the intention is the most important component of any action, 
that determines whether it's virtuous or non-virtuous. So from now on, whatever I do, I'm going to have a good intention and accumulate merit and avoid non-virtue. That's great, you know, and that's what he's encouraging us to do in the first two lines. The second two lines, when he says, even if I then put a stop to laziness, what he's saying is, if I wait until my deathbed and then I stop being lazy, what will be the use? That's not the time we'll be able to practice. Okay, so it's not, yeah, 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 you know, death is coming, but, you know, it's not going to come for a while. There's all these things I want to do. I have this really long bucket list. Yeah. Do you have the expression bucket list here? Yeah, a bucket list, you know, before you kick the gu- bucket, which means <laughs> before you die. Yeah, you have a list of things you want to do. I want to go to Disneyland. I want to go to Sentosa. I want to, you know, do this and that. So you have this whole long list of everything. I want to see my son get married. I want to see my daughter get married. I want to see this. I want to see that whole long list. I want to do all those things. Then when they're all done, then I'll die. Okay, I'll be ready to die at that time. Unfortunately, the Lord of Death doesn't cooperate with that one. But we have this long list, and then we think, I won't die before I do all those things. I mean, I have children. I've got to live until they get married. Yeah, no choice. I've got to. I will. It'll happen. Until you die early. Yeah. And then at the time when you're actually dying, yeah, then you say, oh, you know what? I listened to this Dharma talk before that told me about the importance of purifying negativity and creating merit, and now I'm dying, and I think maybe I should do some of that now. What do you think? How effective is that going to be? It's not, is it? Yeah. Do you really think that as you're dying, you know, if you've never practiced during your life because you've been too lazy, that all of a sudden you're going to have single-pointed concentration? (laughs) Yeah, while you're dying? And you'll be able to generate great compassion for all living beings and as well as the wisdom realizing reality all while you're dying even though you haven't learned anything about it when you're alive? That's not going to happen, is it? That's like, you know how you, how you tell your kids you've got to study for your exam. Yeah, you all put pressure on your children to study for their exams, don't you? Yeah, just as your parents put pressure on you. You've got to study, you've got to study, you've got to study. Okay, but what happens if you don't study and there's exam day? Are you going to be able to study the night before and get everything into your head so you can remember it on the test? Okay, so I have to study beforehand, develop that habit beforehand. Verse 8, when this has not been done, when this is being done, and when this is only half finished, suddenly the Lord of Death will come, and the thought will occur, oh no, I am done for. Okay, so death can come at any time when this has not been done. So there's something that we've always wanted to do and we've never done it. Or there's something we were planning to do on that day and we haven't gotten around to it. So some, even when something hasn't been done, or even when we are doing something, we're vacuuming the floor, 
Yeah, we're at work. Something, we're always in the middle of doing something. You know how my dad died? This is very interesting. He, it, he was turning 93. And the night before his 93rd birthday, my sister and her fiancé had a little party for him at the home. The children were there. They were all, they made my dad's favorite food. He likes steak. He wasn't a vegetarian like me. Okay. So they made his favorite food. They served it to him. They're all sitting around the dinner table eating. And my dad cuts off a piece of steak, puts it in his mouth, turns blue because he choked on it, turned blue, slid off the chair. My sister's fiancé tried to do the Hemler's technique to get him to cough it up. Didn't work. And within three or four minutes he was dead at his own birthday party. With five children there watching. Five teenagers. You know, he wasn't supposed to die that day. Nobody thought he was going to die that day. Yeah, And there it was and it happened. If he had thought, just as he was turning blue, now I'm going to practice the Dharma. <laughs> yeah. No time. Okay. Yeah. So when that thought cut, you know, when that's the situation and death is happening, if we haven't practiced before, then, as Shanti Deva says, the thought will occur, oh no, I am done for. Why? Because we know in the back of our mind that when we die, our body stays here, our friends and relatives stay here, our possessions and wealth stay here. The only thing that comes with us is our karma. And the habitual tendencies that we've developed in our mind over time. And if we haven't done that, it's not going to happen right before we die. Mm -hmm. Verse 9. Their faces flowing with tears and their eyes red and swollen with sorrow. My relatives will finally lose hope and I shall behold the vision of the messengers of death. Yeah. So we can be, you know, in the middle of dying, our relatives are all around sobbing, holding our hand, saying, we love you, you don't die, don't die, we love you too much, don't leave us. Do you have any choice? You don't have any choice, do you? When death is there, we got to go. Okay. Finally, our relatives lose hope, and our consciousness goes off by itself. We may have the whole world around us mourning us, but we still die alone. Yeah. The only thing we take with us is our karma and the imprints of the Dharma practice we've done. But we've neglected that during our life. Yeah. So that makes death rather fearful. If we've practiced well while we've been alive, okay, if we practice somewhat well, then at the time of death we have no fear. That would be nice, actually, you know. And at the time of death we have no regret, saying, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. And if we practice really well, they say that dying is like going on a picnic. Yeah. And I saw one time someone die very well. 
an old monk in Dharamsala. Yeah. One of those old monks that people kind of ignore because they're old. And uh, I was present when he died, and he died very well. He knew exactly what to do, how to work with his mind. Yeah. And when his fellow monks returned home and saw him, yeah, one of them went into the room to check how he was, and he came out smiling because he could see through where the body was losing heat and how this meditator was sitting that uh, he had had a very good death and was going to have a good rebirth. Yeah, it was quite amazing. So there's a difference between someone who practices and someone who doesn't practice. So if we haven't practiced, you know, like all your friends and relatives are there carrying on. How do you think you're going to feel? You're trying to die. And everybody around you is crying. Are you going to be able to die peacefully? <laughs> you know, you want to say, shut up everybody. I need to concentrate. But they don't care. They're involved in their own grief. They're just sobbing, creating a ruckus, grasping onto your hand. Yeah. One of the worst ways to die I can think of is having all my relatives around. Please, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to die with my relatives around. Dharma friends? Yes. My teacher? Yes. You know, yeah, if my Dharma friends can hold it together and help me while I'm dying. But if they're crying, please get out of the room. <laughs> yeah? I have enough problems <laughs> without people crying all around me. Yeah, they've cried the whole time I've been alive. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So verse 10, tormented by the memory of my wrongdoings and hearing the sounds of hell, in terror I shall clothe my body in excrement. What virtue can I do in such a delirious state? So there we are dying. We're tormented by the memories of all of our wrongdoings. All the times we lied, cheated, bad-mouthed people behind their back, gossiped, criticized people, made fun of them, hurt their feelings, lied to them. All of this comes, memories of this comes at the, at the time of death, and we feel tremendous regret for it and tremendous confusion. Yeah. And Hearing the sounds of hell. In other words, we have a premonition that because of all of our destructive actions, we're not going to have a good rebirth. Mm. So here we are dying, remembering all of our misdeeds, having a premonition that we're not going to have a good rebirth. Yeah. And we're losing control of our body, so we clothe ourselves in excrement because we can't control our body anymore. And how are we going to create virtue in that delirious state? So thinking that we can put off the creation of virtue, put off the Dharma practice until we're dying, is complete stupidity. Yeah, that's not going to work as a good excuse for being lazy because we only harm ourselves. Yeah. So sometimes our loved ones nudge us to practice. Sometimes our teachers nudge us to practice. We say, leave me alone. Stop pushing me. They're actually trying to help us so that when the time of death arrives, we'll be able to die peacefully without regrets and without fear. But instead, we just kind of laugh at them and say, leave me alone. 
let me go back to sleep. Verse 11, if even in this life I shall be gripped with fear, like that of a live fish being rolled in hot sand. Imagine that, a fish rolled in hot sand. Or when you go to a seafood restaurant, you know, and you take the seafood and you dump it in boiling water. Yeah? So that's, you know, like the, 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 an analogy of the kind of fear that we experience when we remember our non-virtue and see that it's going to bring an unfortunate rebirth. Why even mention the unbearable agonies of hell that will result from my unwholesome deeds? So even in this life, if we are gripped by incredible fear of thinking of, about the results of our non-virtue, then what to mention if we're reborn in a hellish rebirth and what we'll, ex we'll experience there. Verse 12, how can I remain at ease like this when I have committed the actions that will bear fruit in my delicate infant's body encountering boiling acids in the hell of tremendous heat? Okay, so he's just warning us about the hell realms. And just kind of imagine what this would feel like. You know, we certainly wouldn't, don't want to think of even having boiling water spilled on our hand now. What would it be like in the hell realms with acid in this tremendous heat? Verse 13, much harm befalls those with little forbearance and those who want results without making effort. While clasped by death, they shall cry like the gods, oh no, I have overcome by misery. Okay, so much harm befalls those with little forbearance. People who don't have much inner strength, who, you know, they want to practice the Dharma, but, you know, it's inconvenient. You know, their knees hurt a little bit. They have to get up early in the morning to do it. So, you know, they just don't have the strength to do it. Yeah, so much harm bef beholds people like that if they don't do what's good for them. Okay, and also, harm befalls those who want results without making any effort. Okay? That's kind of like us, isn't it? Yeah? I'd really like to become a Buddha, but without having to do all this study and meditation and practicing generosity and learning to love the people who harm me, you know, I really want Mick enlightenment. Yeah, I want quick, chip, cheap, and easy enlightenment. I don't want to have to exert any effort. Haven't they discovered yet an easier way to get enlightened? Yeah, I mean, the Buddha sent out this path. We're in modern times. Can't he shorten it? Yeah, can't we ask the Buddha to shorten the path? No, because he didn't create it. He just described it. Yeah, but we want results without making an effort. Or the most effort we're willing to make is, you know, we get a jaw stick and we go to the temple. May I have a good rebirth? May I have a good rebirth? Yeah, may my son marry a good, nice girl. May my daughter marry a nice son. May they have healthy children. May I win the lottery. And may I get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I'll offer this joss stick now, dear Buddha. And when you make all those things happen, then I'll make a bigger offering. <laughs> yeah? That's the way we are. Huh? I want enlightenment without making any effort. Yeah. I mean, at the most, I want to pray. Let me pray. Yeah, but I don't want to have to do anything more than pray. You know, I want Buddha to do all the work. And I want it to come by magic. So I'll just pray. Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> yeah. Or, okay, if I really have to do something, you know, I'll, ma I'll make a donation and request uh, a puja or an initiation. And then I'll go to this ceremony. And the less I understand, the bigger blessing I'm getting. Huh, many people are like that. Yeah, I'll just go make this offering, then you do some puja. Yeah? And the le if I understand what you're doing, maybe I don't, you know, it's not going to be a big blessing. But if it's a really mystic, esoteric, far out puja, then I'm going to get a big blessing. Yeah? So you go to the monk who sits on a high throne, wears big hats, yeah, lots of brocade, yeah, they have a bell and a drum, you know, oh, and that drum and that bell, and all these like cymbals and long horns and short horns, you know, and a vase with holy water. That's what you really want. That vase with holy water. You know, and maybe some long life pills. You know, so I want this big thing. Yeah, and then they chant in a deep voice. <laughs> Ring the bell. <laughs> Bang, 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 bang. Oh. Wow, what a blessing I got. That was so far out. Wait until I tell my friends. Yeah? I sat in on this incredible puja, you know? And then, then there was the person who, what we were talking about, you, oh, you put the sticker on the water and then the water gets blessed, you know? And that water becomes magic because of the, there is a sticker on it. <laughs> Then you take the water. <laughs> All the horrible deeds I did towards others are now purified. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they tell you to do, what else do they, they tell you to do? We're talking about this, you know recite this and that, mumble something, this and that, you know, and make a donation. <laughs> Bigger donation, more merit, more purification. <laughs> yeah. And we go for it, don't we? Yeah? We flock, you know? Those people come who promise you everything quickly. <laughs> And we want that. We don't want to have to do anything. Yeah. My mother used to say, what you get for nothing is worth nothing. My mother actually told me a bunch of Dharma things. She didn't know it. 
But she's right, you know, if you don't put forth any effort, what kind of spiritual relation, re, uh, realizations are you going to get? Yeah, if you play Mickey Mouse Dharma practice, you're going to get Mickey Mouse enlightenment. Yeah. And your new mantra will be M I C K E Y M O U S E. Okay. Relying, verse 14, relying upon the boat of a human body, free yourself from the great river of pain. It is hard, as it is hard to find this body again. This is no time for sleep, you fool. So Shantideva has amazing compassion for us. He says, you ha- he compares our life to a boat, a boat that can take us across the ocean of samsara to the other shore, to the side of awakening. Yeah, we have this precious boat of a human life with human intelligence living in a peaceful place where the Buddha's teachings exist, where you have access to the teachings, to teachers, to a Sangha community, to books to read. You have health, you have intelligence, you have interest, you have everything that's needed to practice. So he's saying, you know, use that to free yourself from this great ocean of pain which is cyclic existence. Yeah. And it's hard to find this boat again because when we die, you know, it's, put it this way, it's difficult to create the karma to have this kind of life. When we die, we're not sure to get this kind of life again. So seeing the preciousness of our life, seeing that it doesn't last very long, recognizing the amazing opportunity we have. Don't go to sleep. Yeah. Don't be idle. Don't just laze around and think, I'll practice later. Hmm? Verse 15, having rejected the supreme joy of the sacred dharma, which is a boundless source of delight, Why am I distracted by the causes for pain? Why do I enjoy frivolous amusements and the like? So this is actually going into the laziness of negative actions. But before I talk about that verse, let's pause because you may have questions on what we've covered so far. Because so f- until now we've talked about Uh, you know, what is joyous effort, the three kinds of joyous effort, what the three kinds of, oh, I forgot about the three kinds of joyous effort. I just talked about the three kinds of laziness that interfered with it. Okay, remind me tomorrow I'll do the three kinds of joyous effort or ask a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so we talked about that and then we talked about the first kind of laziness, the laziness of just sloth and sleeping and being idle. Okay. So questions or comments so far? Yeah. Any question? Uh, thank you for your sharing, Venerable. Uh, my question is, yeah, I hear all this uh, about, and I do believe in like rebirth and Yeah, but then the thing is that in life, like, I am still attached to a lot of things. And sometimes it's not, it's not just like a matter of like, oh, this is entertainment, this is fun. But it's also like the people that you meet and the friendships that you make, like, uh, in pursuing a certain interest. And, and also, like, I feel that I'm not ready to give up a lot of things. And to me... It's like I I find enlightenment a bit hard to 
I, I can't really relate to it Like I, mm-hmm. I relate to How to say Being a good person Overcoming my difficulties And mm-hmm. using my life To help others mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily Have that goal Of enlightenment in mm-hmm. mind So uh, I don't know What would you advise Or what do you think of this Okay Okay So You're still attached To many things You want to be a good person You want to benefit others yeah, but enlightenment seems like like really far high and far away, you know, for right now anyway. Yeah, so the thing is that as you learn more about Dharma, yeah, as you learn more, as you think about what you learn, then your mind will slowly change. Yeah, you can't make yourself you know, I'm going to f- make myself have no attachment. No. Okay, you can't force yourself and squeeze yourself. Yeah. This all has to come about through developing your wisdom. And how do you develop that wisdom? You listen to teachings, you think about them, you see if they're logical, you look around and see if they apply to your own life and to the lives of the people you see around you. And if in that way they apply and they make sense, then they can start to influence you. And then very naturally your mind will go towards the Dharma because you understand it. Okay? When we don't know very much because we're at the beginning, or even if we've learned something but we haven't thought about it deeply, then it's very natural that enlightenment seems like, you know, la-la land with Peter Pan and, you know, <laughs> yeah, do I, you know, wh- what's this stuff about enlightenment? What in the world does that mean? Yeah. But as you progress, you'll, you'll get a better idea. One way I like to give people a little inkling of what enlightenment might be like is think about never getting angry again. What would that feel like? Yeah, not that you're stuffing your anger anger down. You're not stuffing anything down. People can say, they can do whatever they want. But in you, there's no seed of anger. So no matter what they say, what they do, your mind is peaceful. Does that sound nice? I think that sounds real nice. Well, that's one of the things that happens with enlightenment. Yeah, we've cut the seed of the anger and even the imprint of the anger. So people do whatever they want. We're peaceful. Sounds good, huh? Yeah, sure would be now what goes on in our mind. People look at us the wrong way and... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so that gives you some little feeling. Okay. Any more questions? Venerable, you have to hold it right in Can front. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You have to. You have to talk loud and hold it right in front okay. of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my family, they, they think they practice the Dharma the way you enacted, like praying and praying for winning lottery, good health. And then they will leave to, to see the successes of their family and friends. S- but I'm not able to share with them what I do, what my practice. Mm-hmm. So they think that what I do is the dead end and what they do is the open path. So when I try a little bit, it kind of get them agitated. Mm. So I refrain from doing that. Then. If I don't join them in the 
praying sessions that they do, it looks like there's a gulf between us. Mm. So I don't want to lose that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do I do what they do? But yeah. in my mind, I don't believe what they do. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a little differ- difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is it is, so? They think you're saying that the, the way they practice isn't the correct way to practice. And you don't want to join them in that, but then there seems to be a division in the family. On that. I, d- I don't think they, they think they're practicing, but we have an altar at home. My mother prays diligently every yeah. day. Uh-huh. So Let your mother pray diligently. Yeah. That's so, okay. So she prays her style, like yeah. may my children, you know, right. have good career, da da da, yeah. and all that. Yeah. So let her pray that. Don't tell her not to do it because she'll get upset. But you can also encourage her to make offerings, you know? Mom, what you're doing is really good, you know? There's a charity, you know, for children who have health problems. What about as a family if we give $20? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah, most people want to help children with health problems. So what you're doing is you're just encouraging her to be generous and to create merit. Yeah? Or, uh, you know, because people ask me all the time how, how to do this. And it's, it's just, you know what, if there's something virtuous that you're doing that you think that they mo- may want to do, animal liberation or... Uh, you know, reading a text or something like that, invite them to do you do it with you for five minutes. Don't ask for much. You know, encourage them to be generous, encourage them to uh, live an ethical life and to not harm others. And that's good enough. You know, because especially with our parents, we're not going to be able to go in there and change them. But we can encourage them in little things, slowly, slowly. Yeah? In the meantime, you can do your practice and, uh, you know, they'll see that you're becoming a happier, more peaceful person and they'll respect your practice. Hmm? Does that make some sense to you? My question is like, how can we uh, recharge our inner strength battery when we go flat? So like day in, day out, right? We were kind of like uh, a bit disappointed or have some anger there. We get what? Like, uh, can, you, can, you, can, can we, how yeah. can we uh, like charge our inner strength? Okay. Uh, recharge the battery that is go flat, you know, the kind of things. Yeah, go flat in one way, like... Like, oh. You're you're t- physically tired, or you're just bored, <coughs> or tired, tired. Well, tired. Yeah. Well, if you're physically tired, yeah, then you need to rest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It comes later in this chapter. It says when you've done something virtuous, and you're tired, rest at the end of it, and then when you're rested resume doing virtue. But when you're resting, at least keep a positive attitude. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Good evening, uh, Venerable. Um, I have one question. Uh, um, How effective is my my Dharma practice? How effective is... How how effective is my Dharma practice if I don't um, have a guru? But I just do my practice, like uh, saying some prayers, doing some meditation, mm-hmm. and just um, do it in my room. Mm. Because, um, yeah, um, yeah, because um, I think I have a guru, but unfortunately, um, <coughs> the Buddhist center, right, I couldn't get along with the Dharma brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. So every time there is a rem- guru rem- remembrance or guru puja, right, um, I don't go. So what I do is I do my own practice. 
and remember my guru. So mm -hmm. is it still uh, effective uh, Dharma mm -hmm. practice? Yeah. Okay. Um, the basic thing is that you do your practice. Yeah. The reason that you have a guru or a spiritual mentor is that's the person who teaches you. Okay. So you learn from your teacher and you do your practice. You don't have to always go and do all the pujas and things with the other disciples if you don't feel like it. You can do your practice by yourself. That's fine. The important thing is that you learn from a reliable teacher, you understand what they're teaching correctly, and then you practice it as directed. That's the important thing. Okay? Good evening. Hello. Uh, good evening. I have a question I would like to share with you. Um, uh, what happens if a person who can't sleep, probably having insomnia, mm -hmm. and uh, he really can't sleep and he do prayer like in the night time, and mm -hmm. um, he's trying to learn breathing, meditations, or listen to the Buddha songs or the relax songs, whatever, but he still couldn't sleep and mm -hmm. probably uh, sleep for two hours or three mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. and what do you think to improve the situation like okay, that? Okay, so what would help somebody who has insomnia? I had some friends, uh, some British friends, and they told me that whenever they couldn't sleep, they put it on my teachings about <laughs> mind and mental <laughs> factors. <laughs> and they said they went to sleep every time. So you can get the teachings on mind and mental factors offline and listen to them and <laughs> <laughs> conk out, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I say just, you know, just the important thing to do, even if you can't sleep, is to relax and rest. Yeah, so don't worry about not sleeping. Just rest, relax, yeah. I always find if I try and recite mantra, I find I fall asleep in the middle of it, <laughs> yeah. You might try something, but you have to do the mantra in your mind, not out loud, you know, and you have to be lying down and the room is dark and, you know, like that. Yeah, but try the try the teachings on mind and mental factors. <laughs> I don't know. We could ask Venerable Semke what she likes most. <laughs> you know, ask one of your friends who falls asleep during Dharma teachings what teaching, you know, they find most sleepable. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. How about not turning it off <laughs> when we okay. pass it in between? Yeah. yeah. Alright, good evening, very well. So, first of all, I just need an affirmation. Wouldn't it be good if, you know, because frequently a lot of people say, I want to commit suicide, I want to, I, because I feel that life is not right. So, counselors usually will say, you know you shouldn't end your life because everyone's going to feel sad but given that just some we discuss that you know death eventually will happen then isn't it good if counselors can just say because you need to treasure this life to practice on what, whatever pr precious thing you need to do I mean given that it's a secular society so I cannot say the Dharma specifically mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about somebody who's suicidal who's yeah. looking for meaning and purpose in their life yeah, I mean, like, I feel counselors should say that instead of saying, you know, your family will feel very bad if you do that. Yeah. Yeah, so you can say your family will feel very badly. That's true. And you can also say, you know, there's great meaning in your life. And you need to learn and seek out pe wise people who can teach you how to make your life meaningful. Yeah. And uh, another thing is about the. I remember a few days ago we were talking about the uh, 
whenever you're angry so you can ask yourself back by saying why are you angry well i tried it out so i'm not sure how to really try it out can you advise a bit more on that yeah okay so this uh for th those of you who haven't heard what so what i sometimes do with myself when i'm angry is i ask i have this little conversation so one side says you know, why are you angry? And the other side said, blame somebody else. Because that's how we usually start out. They did this and this and this and this. Yes, they did that. Why are you angry? Well, they did this and this and this and this. Yes, they did that. But why are you angry? And you keep, you know, y then by doing that, you begin to really ask yourself, yeah, somebody else did that, but why do I need to get angry about it? I can't control this other person. They have their own mind. I can't control it. They do what they do, but it's my choice whether to get angry at them or not. Yeah, so you begin to see that you have a choice in the matter that it's not just because somebody did that that automatically you've got to get angry. You don't have to automatically get angry. Even if your friends say you should be angry, that doesn't mean that you have to get angry. Yeah? When you really slow down and look, okay, someone criticized me. Why do I need to get angry? Really, why? Why? No one's forcing me to get angry. My anger doesn't do any good. It's not that everybody must get angry if this situation happens. Why do I need to, you know, let myself get so thrown by one simple situation. Yeah. What if I tried, the situation happened, and it ended? And I let it end, and I put it down. Instead of, oh, they criticized me, and I caught it. They criticized me, they said this to me, they criticized me, they said this to me, they criticized me, they said this, they said this. Just, you know, they said it once and it was over and done with. I'm repeating it again and again to myself. Huh? That doesn't make much sense. I don't have to do that. The sound waves came and the sound waves went. Finished. Although it wouldn't like, you, you don't have to really force it to I think, ah, oh, the sound wave is here, I should just force it out, that's all. No, you're not forcing. You're just looking at it for what it is without the embellishment that our self-centered mind gives it. And yeah. what is the tone we should say? But why are you angry? Should we like be in a forceful tone and say, why are you angry? Like, yeah, also, yeah. Why are you angry? Why are you angry? <laughs> we need to com be compassionate to ourselves, so I just need to know what the... Yeah. Is. No, we need to be kind to ourselves, going to ourselves, why are you angry? You know, that's, that's not going to work. Yeah, but you have a curious attitude. Why am I angry? Why do I need to get angry? I mean, really, why do I need to get angry? And you're just curious about it. And then sometime in the process you realize, you know, I don't need to get angry. Okay, so we're going to stop now. So we're going to have just a couple of minutes of silent meditation so you can think about what we talked about and then take it home and think about it some more. And then we'll do a short dedication. And do we have the... We have it? And then we'll dedicate the merit. 
really rejoicing at what we've done this evening, thinking about the Buddha's teachings, something that's valuable, putting in our joyous effort to listen and contemplate the teachings. So let's rejoice in that merit and rejoice at all the goodness in the world. Rejoice at all the virtue of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and dedicate it for the awakening and the well-being of each and every living being. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhima not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is on. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and other delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May all who are ill or injured quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may these never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other for as long as space endures and as long as living beings remain. Until then, may I to abide to dispel the miseries of the world.
Thank you, Venerable, for your very precious Dharma teachings. So, brothers and sisters, we hope that you have truly enjoyed and benefited from Venerable's teachings. Uh, Venerable will be still giving a series of Dharma talks, and the uh, detail is actually available on the program list. You can actually inquire from our volunteers. In addition, we need to share a few updates with you. Firstly, Venerable Children and the Monastic will be doing the Lama Chopa Puja on the 28th of January 2017, which is the first day of Chinese New Year. And this Lama Chopa Puja involves making extensive offerings to the lineage of spiritual mentors and doing the seven limb prayer to purify the negativities and accumulate merits. You can request the prayers for speedy recovery, good health and long life, removing obstacles and bringing happiness, harmonious relationships and good rebirth. The prayer request can actually be done online at the Swarasti Abbey website and you can type in your prayer request in the box at the bottom of the page. To make the prayers more effective, you can actually recite and contemplate the four immeasurables on the day of the puja which is on the 28th of January. Yeah? So secondly, as you know, Venerable Children will be uh, will return to U.S. after the teaching program in Asia. Not with, uh, notwithstanding this, you can still receive Venerable teachings online. In fact, Venerable has started giving live stream teachings on the stages of the Path to Awakening, which is the Lam Dream, on Saturday mornings at the request of students in Singapore. So all of you are welcome to join us for the ongoing teachings on the Lam Dream a text by the great 15th century Tibetan Buddhist meditator and scholar Jopa of I don't know how to pronounce that Depo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So the teachings are held every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Buddhist Fellowship East Center located at 160 Paleba Road. So for more details, please check out um, from our volunteers. Last but not least, we also have some venerable books which can which you can browse and purchase as Dharma gifts for your family and members and friends and uh, they're actually available on the ground floor. So once again, thank you Venerable Children for your teachings this is evening and brothers and sisters, let's rise and put our palms together to thank Venerable. Huh? No, you, you can just uh, stay here. So, um, okay, so we are done. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, we just uh, uh, three um, half bows to Venerable. <laughs> okay, for um, for those who, of you who want to purchase the books and uh, let Venerable autograph on it, you can actually do it downstairs. Uh, for the rest, if you would like to get blessings and do some offerings to Venerable, you know you can just uh, queue here, and then yeah, there will be money pills given out by Venerable. Thank you very much and we'll see you tomorrow.
三春万种影，一路来自北大园里，迷路只归是真理。是真理。